Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Thank you, Carla, for that warm welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Commonwealth Club event. My name is Lauren Good. I'm a senior writer at Wired Magazine. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joan Donovan and Emily Dreyfus. Dr. Joan Donovan is the research director of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard. Her work examines internet and technology studies, online extremism, media manipulation, and disinformation campaigns. Prior to joining Harvard Kennedy School, Dr. Donovan was the research lead for Data and Society's Media Manipulation Initiative. And Dr. Donovan, may I call you Joan? Yeah, please. You can call me Dr. <laughs> Joan. Dr. Joan. <laughs> Dr. Joan also, for what it's worth, invented the beaver emoji. So that's very important Good. for everyone to know. Look in your phones. It's there right now. It's there. <laughs> that is her gift to you nestled in your phone. Yeah. Emily Dreyfus, uh, my former colleague at Wired, is the senior managing editor of the Harvard Shorenstein Technology and Social Change team. Emily previously worked at outlets including Wired and CNET and helped launch the tech news site Protocol. She was also a Neiman Berkman Klein Fellow in Journalism Innovation at Harvard University. Emily, it's great to see you again. Great to see you. Together with Brian Friedberg, Dr. Joan and Emily are the authors of Meme Wars, the untold story of the online battles offending democracy in America. This is my copy. There are lots of dog ears in here. I'm really enjoying reading this book. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for moderating. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's really great and to be a part of this event. Um, Emily, before we, uh, we gather here this evening, you and I were chatting, and you said one of the things that you wanted people to know about this book is that it is not just about memes. It is about people. It's about groups and organizations of people who have kind of propelled us through these culture wars over the past decade or so. And so while a lot of these memes may be familiar to some of the people in the room, because they were these disparate news events that have sort of populated our feeds in recent years, there are these people who are behind this. And these are some of, in the book, these are some of the untold stories, that narrative arc that takes us through from around the early 2010s until now. Talk a little bit more about this in the structure of the book. Yeah, so the book, Meme Wars, takes you through a decade of um, po American politics from the far right fringe perspective, although we actually begin at uh, Occupy Wall Street. We look at Occupy, but we especially look at it from the perspective of the people on the right who were watching and learning tactics and figuring out how they could use the internet in a different way. Um, and so it traces these communities online who came together for various reasons and who you and I covered a lot of the things that they did, you know, like Gamergate and events that we read about and we knew we were living through. The book actually goes into the forums and places where they these groups were planning and coming up with those offenses. And so that's what, you know, a meme does not make me a meme war. Mm -hmm. Meme wars require a subculture of people who have who come together to use memes and the internet and social media to to like in a concerted and coordinated way get an idea to go viral or to go mainstream um, and so for me it was really just like so illuminating to look back at the decade and actually see where some of this stuff that made no sense came from you know like when you're living through it there's not a lot of time you, you'll, you'll say like I, I don't know this just bubbled up I don't know where it bubbled up from. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason we wrote the book was because we were watching January 6th insurrection happen. And Joan was like, well, the thing that they're doing here started 10 years ago. And that person that you see over there with that strange flag on their jacket, like that person is a member of this internet subculture that most people have never known. And in that moment, also everyone on TV and on the internet was like, how could this have happened? This came out of nowhere. And so we felt like, okay, we got to write this book because it didn't come out of nowhere. Um, 
right? And memes are such a shadowy thing. Their origins are so shadowy, shadowy. This idea of who made them? Where do they come from? Okay, yeah. now they're just in my feed. That when they actually translate to real life events and sometimes incredibly disruptive or even violent events, yeah. it is jarring to the public to not understand their origins. Maybe it would serve us just to quickly define meme. What is a meme? Sure. You want me to take a shot, Joan? I mean, I'm a little jet lag. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm, it's like 10 p.m. for me or something. I'm just like, oh, okay. I mean, so in the book, we talk about memes as a unit of culture, riffing on Richard Dawkins' definition in the in the 70s of, you know, how do you explain how culture gets transmitted? Well, it, in his view, it was more like a DNA structure, and it would a piece of culture would move from people to people or group to group. Um, and at, over time, you would lose track of who came up with that slogan or that picture. A good example in the U.S. is of Uncle Sam. Mm -hmm. That image of this, uh, he's like really buff for an old man. I don't know if you've looked very closely at Uncle <laughs> Sam. But he's supposed to represent the body politic, the face of the nation. And he's pointing and he's saying, I want you. And it's this, you know, piece of Americana, but doesn't even begin in America. It begins um, in the UK. And so we lose those histories. Memes tend to do the best and become most viral when they're anonymous. And we've seen this. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to highlight wasn't just that, oh, memes online, which are these mostly just images with a couple of uh, quippy words that point out some tr contradiction or they're massively insulting uh, or they're just really funny and they resonate with you. It goes beyond that. Sometimes it's slogans. We've seen memes uh, really taken up over the years over the last hundred years in advertising so you know when you get just do it or i'm loving it you know what that is even in political slogans we've heard and seen memes mm -hmm. become more popular but with the way in which movements started to incorporate memes into political campaigns into mobilization particularly with occupy wall street which um it's really nice to have you both here, April and John, because they saw me suffer through writing my dissertation about Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> but here's a turn of phrase that not many people have ever heard before. People start using it online. It becomes a thing. Jay-Z copyrights it. You know, the Jay-Z is like, this is a thing. I'm going to take that. But... It ultimately, it serves to unify and bring these subcultures together. And what we're trying to point out with looking at the last 10 years of meme wars on the Internet is how those subcultures form and then particularly how they jump from the wires to the weeds, how they become mobilized. And in the case of January 6th, how... A, a mob becomes incited. Mm -hmm. yeah. They become actionable in exactly. a way. It's different yeah. from the early days of viral videos, right, which mm -hmm. experienced a virality on the internet and lots of people sharing, but weren't necessarily able to be replicated or have different sort of words or slogans layered on top of them, right? Yeah, yeah and what's like the reason we started the book uh, when we did is because Occupy also was happen right when social media was going mainstream. Mm -hmm. And so it, before Twitter and Facebook were open to the public and the, like existed the way that they do now, uh, you could go viral in like small spaces. But then as you could share images and video and anything you want, and at first you couldn't share video on Twitter, which was partially why those early tweets weren't video. But there were some really early things that went viral out of Occupy, which people might remember um, the Berkeley, or no, it wasn't Berkeley. It was UC Davis. UC Davis protest pepper when the pepper, cop. the cop, like very mm -hmm. casually pepper sprayed a line of um, peaceful students, and that image was captured in a photo. And then this was like I think probably the first meme I ever was aware of, because it it did all the things that a political meme does when it's successful. It you, it was a simple image. This the guy's body language was so horrifically casual as he was caught spraying this orange spray and the the photographer got it exactly and the students were just sitting there and what people did was cut it out 
in Photoshop and then put it into different situations. So there was like the like the Last Supper, and then there was like the the cop casually um, pepper spraying. And what was interesting is that then that went massively viral. Like I was working at CNET at the time, and we we wrote an article about the meme, um, and the article was about like people are using memes to spread ideas and what it was not about was police violence at a protest um, which also shows the way in which memes can when they like they lose their context mm -hmm. they can they become distorted they become distorted mm -hmm. and you also lose control over them mm -hmm. um, which you know if you look at the book in, in the book some of the most powerful memes someone started they started for a reason it went viral and then it just goes totally out of hand like one of the we, one of the oldest memes that we identify in the book is "Don't tread on me," the Gadsden flag, and we learned like all about where it came from. And and, and the thing is, if you look at it now, it's a libertarian right wing uh, meme. It's a symbol that indicates to people that someone is on the right, uh, and in some cases, white supremacists, the KKK, like very openly use "Don't tread on me" as a meme, but. It's also used at anti, um, uh, at pro-abortion rallies, because people are like, "Don't tread on my right to have an abortion." Um, so it's flexible and can be used in a lot of different ways. And I think we should bring that one. I think we should uh, try to get that one back. <laughs> Honestly, when yeah, you say she's that. just obsessed with snakes. We, she's kind of thing. <laughs> I just so what's cool. What, what's interesting about it, like the reason why it was a rattlesnake, the reason why Benjamin Franklin picked that was because it's indigenous to the United States and he wanted something that would be a threat to Britain to say like do not mess with us uh, mm -hmm. but he picked the snake because the rattlesnake is a, like a gentlemanly snake who will give oh, you a it warning gives you a little warning <laughs> lets you know <laughs> yeah you know F-A-F-O yeah and then there's a chapter of the book that I, we won't say the name out loud because it's got a two F words in it um, or I guess just one F <laughs> around and F find out and find yeah. out right, right. Yeah. Um, but yeah. so F around and find out is basically the 2020 like AAVE viral meme version of Don't Tread on Me. Mm -hmm. And Joan, did you invent the rattlesnake emoji as well? <laughs> no, that would have <laughs> been a good one though. Yeah. But yeah, I'm still on the hunt for things that haven't been made into emojis that could be. So well, some some of these memes might be yeah. fertile ground for you for that. Know. Yeah. You never know. So you've mentioned um, you've mentioned Occupy Wall Street a few times now. Mm. You wrote your dissertation on Occupy Wall Street. I don't know if many people know how well the right wing basically observed what was happening with Occupy and co-opted some of those tapped tactics and took some of those hashtags and made it into their own movement. Yeah. And this is really the, the whole first chapter of your book. Talk about this. So one of the things that we wanted to explain is we didn't want to rewrite a history of... So, like, the big trick of the book is it's a history of the internet. Surprise! Right? <laughs> but we didn't want to write the same history of the internet told through, you know, look at all these awesome tech companies innovating, and it's good mm -hmm. for democracy. Like, there's hundreds of those books. And then coming from, a, a, you know, scholarship on the internet, the left and progressive movements are very well historicized. But no one has really taken the right wing seriously as a social movement that uses the internet differently. And so during Occupy, I was living in LA and Andrew Breitbart, who's most famously Breitbart.com, would come by and rile up people and people would follow him around and there'd always be video cameras around him. Come by where? Come by Occupy, Occupy LA. Yeah, and, and it turns out he was filming a documentary with his buddy. This guy, you probably never heard of him, Steve Bannon. <laughs> oh, light dawns over Marblehead, right? So we finally figure out, okay, what did they care about, about Occupy? They made a movie called Occupy Unmasked. And in it, one of the central tenets is that Occupy was a hoax to begin with because there was a person at Occupy who had created a fake email address saying he was the um, manager of Radiohead. Mm. 
and that Radiohead is going to come play at Zuccotti Park at 4 o'clock. Everybody be cool. Tweet it out. Let the world know. So the people that were running the Occupy Wall Street social media account tweeted it out to something like half a million people, which then triggered Radiohead to have to respond on Facebook by saying, cool movement, but we're playing Madison Square Garden <laughs> on Zuccotti <laughs> Park. And then Radiohead fans on social media were like, yeah, I know, just like Radiohead to say they're not coming. <laughs> so thousands of people went down and hung around and met other people and talked about the movement and found their solidarities. And But what you learn is that that kind of hoaxing can take people from what they're doing into a whole nother space. Um, and they didn't really even seem to be that mad that they had gotten hoaxed. It was just sort of like, ha ha, this thing happened. And then you saw the rise of many, many Occupy uh, camps across the United States. And that organization was something that in some ways reflected what Ron Paul had already been doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Ron Paul organizers were using the internet basically to meet one another, to get organized, to do canvassing. And they also, uh, when they saw Occupy happen, jumped at it. And they came to Occupy encampments chanting, end the Fed. And that end the Fed became a very symbiotic and almost cornerstone value within the Occupy movement from many people who didn't even know what they were chanting. Like, they didn't know what the Fed was, mm -hmm. but it, it, banks were terrible, and banks got bailed out. We got sold out, so why not end the Fed? I mean, I, it, Occupy got wild. Someone was like, you got to invest in gold. And I was like, I got to make money first. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, was a college dude. But throughout the long tail of the book, we trace those figures of, of Bannon and Roger Stone and Breitbart. And we try to understand how things that are happening in the grassroots uh, become well-resourced, particularly Bannon is very good at picking up people and making them superstars, like Milo Yiannopoulos yeah. plays mm -hmm. a pretty big role. Uh, and then there were points where this live streamer Baked Alaska was very influential in, in streaming the, the alt-right uh, and the and in particular the, the Unite the Right rally. And so we, we trace that mobilization of that youth vanguard that called itself the alt-right for a while mm -hmm. and then as it matures and Trump becomes elected we try to understand the way in which things that are bubbling up um, through the internet Trump and his associates figure out really quickly how to insert those into his campaign things like lock her up and build the wall for instance mm -hmm. and those slogans become more than just things people say they become grievances they become t-shirts but they become really uh, a way to signify to one another that you're part of something yeah. even MAGA for instance mm -hmm. is, a, is a really big meme mm -hmm. So over the past decade, our technological tools have changed so much. Mm -hmm. um, but th that core element of just, it's a simple phrase, it's something that can be oft repeated, it's something that can be easily weaponized, that really hasn't changed all that much over the past 10 years. Yeah, the internet didn't invent memes. Mm -hmm. um, and the, it didn't invent culture wars either. Uh, and one of the most resonant memes in the book, which is viral in a among far right members of Gen Z, which I think often people f think Gen Z is a woke, like a fully woke liberal generation, um, but there really does exist like a far right youth component in the US. Um, and one of the memes that's most resonant with them is America First, which that meme is dates back to the early, er, like early 20th century. Um, but it has the components of a good meme. It's it's short, it's memorable, it can contain within it like very complex ideas, which is what it did even when it was invented by Wilson, when he meant it as like, hey guys, we actually should go fight a war because we need to lead the nation. And then very quickly his rivals were like, America first actually means that we shouldn't go to war. We should be isolationists and defend ourselves first. Mm -hmm. And it 
and now to this like far right Gen Z group of kids on the internet and in real life, it means our kind of America is what should be first. And our kind of America in their definition is white, male, Christian, Catholic in some cases. Um, and that was such a resonant meme that they shared using imagery uh, on YouTube, like branding. And they made their own flags. They made their own flags. And, that, and then from there, they got so much support online that then they went from the wires of the internet to the weeds of the real world. And um, the kind of influencer character in which we have a chapter charting his rise, he then created a real life conference for America First Believers, which has been written about in the news because Marjorie Taylor Greene spoke there and Paul, Paul Gosar, Gosar. Mm -hmm. and other candidates. But right now, it, like two years ago, that conference was like, you know, white supremacists are at that conference, which which was accurate. I mean, the, the statements being said from the podium at the those conferences were outright brazen white supremacist, misogynistic um, ideas. But that entire meme war, the America First meme war, which I think is like the se seventh chapter of our book or something, was so successful that now there are upwards of 50 candidates running for office in the midterms right now who are running as America First candidates. Um, and they're doing it under the new resurgent meaning of that war of that term. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, all like all the best memes, whether it's a war like an image with words on it or just a slogan, it has to be short, pithy, a little weird, like stop the steal is a great one because it's just a little bit ungrammatical, like just enough that you're like, what are you talking about? Stop the stealing. <laughs> like, what? This doesn't make any sense. But you need it to be a little wrong like that because then it lodges in your brain. Um, and it just has to be easy to share. Right. Like a much, much more benign example are cat memes, right? Right. Or Icon has. Um, it's, yes, they can be a little bit awkward, a little bit goofy. Mm -hmm. um, we're certainly going to talk about Stop the Steal on January 6th because your, your book is, it's bookended by that event. It's in the introduction. It's the final chapter. Um, and also we just have to talk about Donald Trump as the ultimate meme. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to talk to you about Gamergate. Mm. This is chapter three of your book. And Gamergate, it seems, re it really felt like a tipping point in the world of memes, mm -hmm. in the culture wars. Because I think for a lot of people, Gamergate probably came across as just sort of a binary thing. Like either you believed it was about ethics and gaming journalism, or you believed it was about misogyny. And in reality, it was a lot more nuanced than that. And when I say it's a tipping point, it... Folks who were playing games were really into the gaming world were some of the earliest people on the internet mm -hmm. and they knew how to wield their power on the internet. And they're also incredibly, you point this out in the chapter, incredibly powerful consumers mm -hmm. because the gaming industry is so huge. What did Gamergate represent at this moment in the culture wars? Yeah, so it comes about at a time when um, you're, you're also witnessing the rise of Black Lives Matter. Uh, people are starting to really get into, like the general population is finally starting to understand identity politics. And so gamers at that point um, were angry that people were insisting that they were misogynistic, that they were racist, or even that they were uh, not in education or training, right? That there were these neats or these beta males. Or and that they couldn't like get a girlfriend. Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. so um, there are joking ways that people began to deal with this by, you know, building this fake country called Kekistan, where they could all unite under a singular identity uh, and as a, an oppressed minority even. But with Gamergate, it's a joke to some and it's serious to others, but that kind of irony and that ironic hedge is something that um, brought out a ton of participation. Mm -hmm. So people were participating when they didn't really know the full story of what side they were on, but they knew that there was a, a quest online to get this woman to shut down her account or to, you know, get her swatted or to get her address. And, and so you saw within Gamergate all of these little game-like missions that were bringing people together. 
at the same time that they were able to exercise uh, not just their violent misogyny, but also their anti-black racism. Mm -hmm. And they could do that through social media. And they also learned in that moment, too, how to impersonate other groups and how to take over hashtags. So they learned a lot of tactical things while at the same time, Steve Bannon was funding Milo Yiannopoulos to cover it at Breitbart. Mm -hmm. and, and Steve Bannon knew, and he's been quoted as saying as much, that he really wanted to target and, and, uh, and bring together this army of young disaffected men mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, this, and milo had to apologize to the gamers initially right? well because he right. didn't get it at first right. he didn't get it he he came out first saying yeah these this is a bunch of degenerates that right. play video games well he, he he did the classic thing of like they're you know kids in their mom's basement and they're nobodies and then he had just started it at breitbart and he was writing these articles he was a promising young writer and they weren't going anywhere Mm -hmm. And then he wrote a positive thing about Gamergate. And because Gamergate was going viral and bringing all of these people together and all these missions and all these things, and they were like um, leveling up their power level or whatever, they they went and read his article. So his that was his first viral, like successful article at Breitbart. And in that moment, like, you know, a good Trumpian um, acolyte that he would go on to become, he really looked at the ratings and he took a cue and he then pivoted to be covering Gamergate from a positive perspective. And he was like, you're my people and I am I am your leader. And that, that was the other thing that's crazy about uh, going back and looking at these ops is that there were so many influential, like essentially influential people in the media or people who were curators online who were the ones who amplified these things to make them successful. So like in the in the Gamergate chapter, I was at Wired when Gamergate happened and you know, confused by it and impacted by it and whatever. But one thing I certainly didn't know <laughs> was that there was a troll, a very famous troll and very famous to some on YouTube and he goes by the name Jim. <laughs> Or what's his other? Uh, uh, Mr. Mediker. Mr. Mediker. And this Which guy. Is a misspelling of mediocre. Mis he was like going for it. I don't know. It's dumb. So this guy is an anonymous yeah, troll. Like yeah. people don't know who he is. Yeah. Well, we do now. He got swatted recently. Are we positive? Yeah, no. Yeah. They, they, now they're sending potatoes to his house. Yeah, uh, well. Because he's so Irish. That's, Get it, that's guys? part of meme wars. Get it? But so this guy, Jim, he made these videos on YouTube that were about this thing that was happening, Gamergate, which was like a attack on the idea that um, games needed to have more representation and not just be white male. Um, and that and then it was also an attack on the fact that this one game that was made by a woman and was kind of like edgy and whatever had gotten universally good reviews mm -hmm. across the gaming media mm -hmm. sphere. It was which, called Depression Quest. I remember Yes, this. Depression it Quest. All, it was about battling depression. And so the thing that was crazy is that all these, these gamers who were like, oh, they're trying to make our games have women in them, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> that, are, that are wearing women who are wearing clothes. Uh, what they didn't like about, one of the things they didn't like about Depression Quest was that when those reviews all came out, they came out at the exact same time. Uh, and which is interesting from a media perspective because you and I are journalists and we understand that sometimes there's something called an embargo where of course the reviews are going to come out at the same time because they only let you publish at a certain moment, um, which is likely what happened in this case. But it also they, people were talking and, you know, and they and so these gamers made it seem like it was media manipulation, right? A coordinated effort, coordinated yeah. effort. And they were like, there's no ethics in gaming journalism, which then itself became a meme, that phrase. Um, but so this guy, Jim, saw all this happening and all these various different ways in which they were getting mad about it. And they were like attacking the comment sections and they were, you know, sending the police or whatever to the game developer's house. And he made these videos covering it like translating it for a bigger audience. Like, hey guys, this is what's happening. This is what Gamergate is. This is what's going on. And those videos then helped the movement go so much bigger and introduced it to a whole other crop of people who then participated in it. And what we see, you know, Gamergate has been called like the blueprint for the 
great meme war, which is how the meme warriors refer to 2016's effort to get Donald Trump into the presidency. Um, and one of the ways in which that's definitely true is that you see these characters that we will introduce you to in the book who play this like really essential behind the scenes role in amplifying these ideas and reaching people. You've mentioned swatting a couple of times, including with uh, potatoes, which mm. is a new one. I haven't heard of that. <laughs> Only one if you're Irish. Only if you're Irish. Is it apparently. swatting if it's potatoes? Is it, yeah, is no, it swatting? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> First he was swatted, they sent the yeah. cops. Because you then call it people. mashing. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> Sorry. He's going to make a t shirt out of that now. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, some of we're, the, the potatoes are rather humorous, I suppose. Um, you talk about in incredibly violent acts in the book, yeah. how um, people have become radicalized. You write about uh, Dylan Roof, mm. who committed a racially motivated murder in South Carolina, killing nine people. You talk about Elliot Roger, who went after women in particular at a sorority house uh, around Santa Barbara. Um, these are horrific, horrific acts. And these men were down these internet rabbit holes yeah that were feeding their hateful beliefs. How does a meme go from a meme to that kind of act? So uh, there are a couple of profiles of people like Dylan Roof and Elliot Roger who left behind manifestos. And one of the things that we see almost patterned now yeah. in our media is you'll see in a violent event will happen There'll be a rush to figure out who did it. And then that person will have left behind some kind of internet manifesto, some kind of ephemera that explains why they did it. These things are laden with memes. They're constructed in a way so as to get picked up by the media. But what they really want to do is be read by their peer groups. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting about... Um, Dylan Roof's manifesto is he tells us very clearly that he was concerned with everybody talking about Trayvon Martin. He didn't understand why people were calling Zimmerman um, white. And so he was going to go online and he was going to look at, you know, this case and he came across this key phrase of uh, black on white crime. And he decided to put that into Google. And then he says this. He says, that search changed my life forever. Mm -hmm. That's when because, he was red-pilled. Yes, yeah, because then he went to the right. Council of Concerned Citizens. And he learned all about what uh, people talk about online are, that are hate facts. So these are memes that uh, often travel online. And they try to have some sciencey looking uh, truth or piece of evidence in them. Usually when you scratch the surface, it's a lie. But um, so these hate facts are all over the place on places that Stormfront, uh, that Dylan Roof used to frequent like Stormfront and Daily Stormer. Which are and, Nazi websites. Which are, yeah. Um, and I studied them in my postdoc when I looked at when um, white supremacists use DNA ancestry tests, like how do they reckon with the, the findings? So I, was, I had done research on that, was very familiar with those message boards, and then wanted to write a chapter, the, this, the chapter No Safe Space for Hate, to understand, well, what, what happens when he's, you know, he, he left behind this um, blog of images of him at the beach carving uh, in the sand 1488, which means the 14 words and 88 meets Hail Hitler, 14 words are a white nationalist slogan. And you think about it, and he's and he's got a he's got a little flag that he ordered for Rhodesia, which is a um, a, a place that many white nationalists want to return to. It's like a former, you know, African country that mm -hmm. it, that has become a mythical place for white supremacists because they believe that mm -hmm. it was where white people ruled and could be free, and yeah. it was never like that. The, it's mm -hmm. a totally fake history, but it is now a, a meme mm -hmm. of its own. And then. In the next chapter, when we're looking at um, where the manosphere comes from, we look at the manifesto of Elliot Roger to understand, well, where was he getting these ideas? What was he searching for? And 
over the last decade or so of doing this research online, I will tell you that, you know, many lonely people will Google things like how to get a date. How do I get a girlfriend? And there are sites out there that monetize this and are incredibly hateful to women. Yeah. And so you can end up in these rabbit holes just by searching. Yeah. And with Elliot Rogers, he was obsessed with um, race, interracial uh, relationships, and um, video games and World of Warcraft. And so even within his manifesto, there were, there were lots of memes and lots of ways of thinking about the world that often are piggybacked through memes, um, including ones about how women deny you sex and love and that women, like, I mean, he's, he's seriously in the manifesto being like, women, they can go have sex anytime they want. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just out there for them. Women are, the, the world is theirs, mm -hmm. right? And like, mm -hmm. I'm like, have you ever been a woman? <laughs> I don't, this, like, I don't this think this just doesn't happen. Like, <laughs> it's not like how the world works, but okay. But this is his imaginary and it's reflected back to him through the games that he plays, through the, the message boards that he frequents. And so we use those key violent moments to go deeper into the communities that give rise to that kind of behavior. And also because in these communities, so like Elliot Roger, he had all sorts of things going on, but he then became a hero. When he did this oh, heinous act, he killed these women. He became the supreme gentleman. Yeah, he became a meme. They in, in these subcultures, they gave him his own name, his own moniker, the supreme gentleman. They went, they poured through every bit of his manifesto. They saw themselves reflected in him. And now he is, a, is like a heroic figure online in, or in some of these forums. And you can go into places where these kinds of lonely people are are hanging out and images of him and references to him are still being traded to this day um, and used as a reaction to mean and indicate something. Uh, and I, I mean, we have, we, we covered Dylan Roof and we covered Elliot Rogers and we covered the insurrection in terms of violent, like seriously violent acts and, and Charlottesville um, where a woman was killed. But the truth is we could have started every chapter basically mm -hmm. with, a, with an incident of mass violence because basically we have 10 chapters that chart like one central meme war. So one central idea. The second chapter is like hatred. It's like anti-black hatred. Um, the third chapter is like anti-women hatred. Mm -hmm. And in in each of those years and, and under each of those banners, there were horrible, horrible things, horrible crimes committed. And literally our editors were like, guys, you can't start every chapter of this book with a mass murder. You absolutely can't. And, and they were right. I tried. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and it was, it, it also just is so, it's so horrible to read how much there are people who glorify the, these folks. And, you know, as a member of the media, like we have been trained, you know, let's not use maybe even the name of the shooter. And there's all these best practices that have evolved as this violence has gone uh, and become more common and school shootings have become more common and, and going into the forums that are archived online, like you can look at them. I don't recommend it, but we did it. Um, what you see is there's a really good reason for that because these folks are, they, they themselves become a symbol of something that's mm -hmm. possible mm -hmm. and a symbol of like someone who actually went from memes to war, you know? Uh, and I mean, in, in Dylan Roof's case, it's also just, it's all of it is such a tragedy. It's all a tragedy, but it, you know, it's also just so awful. Like he was a very, very lonely person. He tried to make friends with not other Nazis, like other white supremacists, and it didn't work. And so like his next best thing was to become a murderous hero to them. Mm -hmm. How, um, I want, I want to get to the insurrection, um, and by that I don't mean I personally want to go to the insurrection, I just mean I want to get to the topic, but w how liable should the platforms be for this? I mean, your book, it's, there are dozens of platforms in your book where this content is being hosted, where it's being shared, um, ranging from Reddit, which a lot of us use for perfectly benign things, 
to um, Instagram, yeah, to the Daily Stormer, uh, to I mean, really, really dark places on the web. How? And I know right now, um, you know, Section 230 is being sort of reevaluated here in the United States. This is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which basically rules that tech companies that run these platforms are not liable for some of the hateful content that shows up on their on their sites. Um, I think currently the Supreme Court is reevaluating two cases that could sort of reinvent this. But how, I mean, how responsible are, are the platforms? So when I think about it, you know, we have to think about a few different factors here, which is we have an internet that is incredibly decentralized, but at the end of the day, if you want to put a website up, you have to interact with five or six different companies you know, from your domain registrar to your cloud hosting company, to your content delivery network, to um, uh, your ISP. And everywhere along the way, there's possibilities for content moderation. And most companies will say, not my problem. Right. And it's only when you have a website that says, well, we want to have a healthy and vibrant discussion that isn't out of hand, that the communities don't feel unsafe here, that you, they'll, you'll see them start to implement content moderation rules. A site like Reddit, for instance, has evolved their content moderation rules over time and um, and has had to deal with these very meme wars in a way that has reshaped the kinds of discussion that they're going to allow on their platforms. And I think that in the early days around when Section 230 was put together, 1996, and everybody remember 1996? Mm -hmm. Dial up, right? <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> like, we weren't thinking about, oh, you're going to sit in your living room and stream whole movies. Oh, you're going to go to a, a protest and be able to stream it in HD. Right? You used to need a whole satellite truck to do stuff like that. And so the rules that once held good for broadcast can't apply to an information environment where we are each our own television station. And so... The problem lies in the design. And in particular, you have very a few companies that have built uh, products that they cannot monitor and they cannot operate safely. So it's sort of like someone building a plane and saying, well, I don't care that Logan Airport has rules. I'm just going to land. And if something gets messed up, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. And we don't have those guardrails. We haven't, you know, uh, not to get too science studies about this, but a car doesn't need seatbelts to go. Right. Seatbelts are a moral decision about how cars need to protect the people that are in them. And so what are the moral decisions we need to make about the design of social media so that we're cr creating more community safety and less uh, harm? And so the, in the book, we try to get people to understand that if you try to do that on a content by content basis, more and more of these people are just going to keep coming up because mm -hmm. if you're profiting from it and you're getting your politics done and it's fun, that's it. Mm -hmm. Like that's your, that's your Friday night. So I think we have to do a few things. Uh, our colleague, Brandy Collins Dexter wrote a book called black skinhead that also came out last week. Um, and we've been toying with these ideas for, for a decade now, but we have to get at the design. We have to build a public interest internet that isn't just in the purview of these six major companies. We need better data protection laws, especially for children, mm -hmm. um, es especially because the laws that we do have, we can't even implement because we don't have the data from the companies about mm -hmm. you know how many children are using YouTube every day. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of things that have to happen outside of just, you know, 
treating disinformation or meme wars like a, like a series of nails because then section 230 is the only hammer we have to move beyond that we have to demand a digital public infrastructure one that works in the public interest and then in many ways we have to descale uh social media so that mm -hmm there is a way to make people culpable for the sharing and spreading of the kinds of content that cause people to um, violently revolt. Uh, Descale is such an interesting choice of words because <laughs> all we've heard, Emily and I have heard, and I'm sure you've heard over many years as tech companies grow is scale, scale, scale. How can we scale? There's so much emphasis on scale, so much emphasis on growth. Um, that a lot of times I think the those guardrails are not in place because it would prevent growth, that hockey stick growth that everyone's Absolutely. looking for, and then monetization. All right, but let's talk about Donald Trump. Is it possible, <laughs> sorry everyone, is it possible to draw a straight line from the Occupy Wall Street memes of 2012 to January 6th? Not without Donald Trump. <laughs> Yeah, but you can. And since he was there, you, you absolutely can. The tactics that the right observed with Occupy and then cemented for themselves in the film uh, Occupy Unmasked, which came out a year after the uh, Occupy ended, but told this new story of like the narrative of what it was. Scary thing that uh, then led to the things like Gamergate, Manosphere and the creation of these like subcultures using the internet to mainstream their ideas then donald trump came and announced that he was running for president right when the gamer gators were high on their own supply of what they had managed to do with that gamergate and he here was this man who's already a living breathing meme there's so Explain that what do you mean by that because he it's like he played himself. He played a character of himself on television. Like if we're going to talk about like where is where is reality mm -hmm. when he was he he has he had become and he played himself in Home Alone and other films from the 90s where when a rich American man was needed, there was Donald Trump. He became an archetype. Um, and, and then because of all of those media appearances and his television show, there also was just vast amounts of imagery about ar around available about him, which if you're gonna launch a bunch of memes about someone, you really need a lot of content. So there's a ton of content about Donald Trump. Uh, and then also he is just a, like a meme, like a successful meme, he's a little weird. Like, he looks a little weird. You know, he's got some memorably weird things. He talks weird. Bigly. <laughs> um, yeah. Bigly. And, and yeah. he's also, importantly, transgressive. Like, transgressive of whatever system he's in. Mm -hmm. Like, he's, a, he's not a status quo embracer. And, and m people who are launching memoirs or fighting memoirs are trying to make something that has been unpopular, something that has been fringe, like white supremacy mainstream mm -hmm. and, and and you write in the book that, that these fringe groups saw him as the institution in the sense that he was like this you know very famous white man with a huge platform but they also saw so exactly so he he had some of the um trappings of the institution wealth whiteness maleness um celebrity and you would think that in some some of those ways, some ways these folks wouldn't like the they don't like elites, but Donald Trump does not present himself as an elite. He presents himself as someone who like they wouldn't let they don't want me to be president, you know. But I'm gonna try it anyways. And so they also recognize them in him this like transgressive underdog, hmm. which is a kind of that narrative he honed during 2015 when he was trying to get the nomination and Issy Lepowski's here in the audience today she was covering that with me at Wired and we were you know like is this going to happen how is this going to happen and you know the mainstream GOP did not want him to be the nominee and in fact we're going to talk about stop the steal you know stop the steal does not 
did not begin in 2020. Stop the Steal is a website registered by Roger Stone in 2015 first because he assumed that Trump was not going to get the nomination because why would he get the nomination? He was Donald Trump. And then when he got the nomination, Stone just kept that like that meme, that meme offense, that website in reserve for when it would be needed. Um, yeah, but and, and, and Trump then managed to embrace a bunch of memes that were bubbling up from his community. This is the other thing that he did that was different from other politicians before him, although Ron Paul had somewhat done it, mm -hmm. um, but to a less successful way. Um, he embraced the memes that his like very fervent supporters were workshopping in forums, and he amplified them, and he retweeted them, and he turned them into his platform, which is not what any other politicians do you know they they come up with their slogan and then they tell it to you and Hill, like Hillary Clinton when she was running like she had her slogan when then there was Jeb with his it was just Jeb and an exclamation point <laughs> <laughs> which would not have passed muster in the workshopping yeah. groups online yeah. of uh, yeah. on 4chan because like frankly they're better branders than Jeb was well but you know and Trump had some failures too like CAG it was okay, like tag, totally. keep America great. You know, it just didn't, it didn't stick. But because he's always putting so much out, like just so much all the time, doing what Steve Bannon, you know, advised. Taught, it, taught him, yeah. Yeah, he taught him like throw, like, uh, what is it? Flood the zone with shit is yeah. what Bannon suggested. And, and Trump learned that lesson and did it. So if CAG doesn't work, whatever. It's fine, he'll move on. Mm -hmm. He'll embrace a new QAnon slogan or something. And and so his his lack of um, principledness and, and, and consistency was actually a huge benefit to him because he could pivot and he could absorb and, and say like, like Milo Yiannopoulos saw that Gamergate was what got him clicks. Trump could see, oh, oh, this is the narrative that my, that the folks who are gonna vote for me are liking and he could adopt it. And instead of seeming like he abandoned his principles, it was just in keeping. Joan, did you want to expound upon that or should we get to I think it's questions? just, yeah, it's important to understand that he was not alone, right? Roger Stone comes out of many, many years of organizing political campaigns, carrying out different kinds of political dirty tricks. Uh, he's the one making the most money off of Locker Up because he's selling the T-shirts that say it, you know. And then when Bannon joins the Trump campaign towards the towards the end of the campaign, it's so that they can unite Breitbart and the fervor of the online groups that were plugged in and and wed that very tightly to the campaign messaging, so that it, it sounded like. Trump was continuously talking back to all of these different audiences. Many people experienced Trump's Twitter feed as being of, you know, it was just paranoia and craziness. And, you know, it, he's talking to 10 people at once. And that's that was true. He was talking to boomers. He was tweeting Pepe the Frog. And mm -hmm. he was trying to get everyone in this big tent but I'll say uh, it's not that he was masterful. He also, you know, was up against a very weak competition yes. at yes. that moment, especially the way that Clinton, uh, she would come up with things like basket of deplorables. Many people don't know this. She actually was the first to use the term fake news to describe Breitbart. Um yeah, I know. It's crazy stuff you learn if you do the history. It's like wild. It's like, do, do, do. Like, <laughs> that's how you do the history. That's, do, that's do, how do, you do. do. <laughs> you get the history done, and then you're like, oh, man, it's all inverted, right? But that basket of deplorables thing became T-shirts and memes for the, the nascent Trump army to unite under. And I think, for me, what's most important is how the memes are able to help people get coordinated yeah. across space and time. It, it doesn't just say, oh, be part of this thing and spam the internet with this slogan. It says, there is something here, do your research, become part of this community, mm -hmm. donate here, click like and share, uh, show up, will be wild, mm -hmm. right? There's all of the same things that you see in 
network social movements that we applaud in the way that Standing Rock, Black Lives Matter, um, other pro-social movements over the years have been able to come together to get change against authoritarian states even. Um, all of that is at play here, but we have not tuned the rules or the algorithms to stamp down that kind of political oppression. Like to this day, and I think today is the day to talk about Elon Musk <laughs> he's bringing Trump back to, he paid $44 billion to bring Trump back to Twitter. And we are still not talking about what Trump did as political suppression, mm -hmm. right? That it, it, we're still in this, well, he has free speech kind of mode. Yeah. And that's where Americans seem incredibly deluded. If you go outside of America, people are like, are you okay? Mm -hmm. And we're like, I don't know. I don't know if we're okay. Yeah. You tell me. <laughs> yeah, I think the few empty seats here are from some of my journalist friends who texted me late in the day and said, sorry, can't make it. Elon Musk happened again. I know. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty standard day in newsrooms. They could have gotten a quote out of me. Yeah, they could have. <laughs> 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 See? Text him back. I'm going Let to. him know. <laughs> Dr. Joan is here. Yeah, because I'm mad about talk. it. I'm mad about it. Let's get to some of our audience questions. You, um, you all sent in some great questions. We may not get to all of them. Uh, how does the left use memes or media differently? How similar are the tactics in leftist online spaces, Reddit, et cetera? Uh, the structure is very different. Yeah. So uh, you can take, uh, defund the police was a meme war on the left. So within the left, the progressive left, the, the left that were in office hated it, right? You know, you've got Mayor Bill de Blasio. The saying, DNC, the DNC hated the it. The DNC hated it, but you have the grassroots, the, the left that's coming out of the streets. I, you know, I'm gonna discount anarchists and Antifa here. They're not interested in a voting bloc. But that defund the police when it started to gain momentum and you started to see it more places and then politicians had to reckon with it. That's one of the things that's most important about the internet is that we have no more local news, right? Because everything that goes online is international. And if you can get something to that level of the national, the press has to cover it. Because if they don't cover it, they look like they're creating a void on purpose. So defund the police became this very uneasy way of reporters wanting to push, you know, politicians who on the one hand will show up in African garb saying Black Lives oh Matter, God. right? And then on the other hand, won't listen to the demands of the movement who are saying you gotta defund the police, right? And so that's how those memoirs play out in that space. And I just, as a researcher, the work is out there. People are charting those histories. People are capturing those uh, modes of interaction. But the only other thing I'll say is about the left wing and the right wing media ecosystem, uh, and this is in Rob Ferris's book, Networked Propaganda, is that the right is highly coordinated. So their news outlets will share each other's stories. Whereas if the Wall Street Journal were to share the New York Times, I would literally quit my job <laughs> and... <laughs> I would be done because that's all that's all they need to do to win the news war is to share each other's content. Like if they want to get rid of disinformation, then real reporters got to share each other's news mm -hmm. and they never will. I hope Rupert Murdoch is listening to this, you know, but on the right, <laughs> you have daily caller sharing stuff from the New York Post, New York Post sharing post millennial. Like it's all intertwined and the narratives are tighter and they cover stories that never get covered in the center or the left. So it always seems fresh and new uh, in right-wing news. And on the left, it just doesn't have the same, there's not even the same kind of rising stars that you see on the right that come out of YouTube on the left. I know a lot of people are saying, you know, Young Turks, Hans Piker might be the new what next for the left, but 
I don't, I don't see it personally. I mean, and the other thing about the right and left ecosystems being different is not just that the media companies on the right are coordinated and they are willing to amplify each other and support each other and have this urgency of like, oh, we are all, you know, everyone on board right now we're going to agree with each other so that we can make this story get out there and people see it. It's also that level of participatory urgency happens among the readers on the right. And they are in, like their pol the politicians and the like right wing um, reporters and journalists treat the readers like a participatory constituency and will highlight their comments or will tell them like share this with your friends um, and ask them to be a part of it in and you know we cover QAnon in the book which je in there they call themselves um what do they call themselves? <laughs> Internet warriors? Oh, digital soldiers. Digital soldiers, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Which was coined by General Flynn when he was in office. And like in, in a lot of ways, right-wing media, far-right media readers are digital soldiers. They feel that they have a role to play in this like war to get the mainstream to care about certain things. And for in many ways, it's because they believe the mainstream or the left or whatever isn't covering it. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's and this. And then they'll tell their audiences that too. Oh, this and is what you're, you'll never hear over here. Totally. You'll hear it here. And there's other differences too. Like there's not as much scrupulous, like intentional uh, <laughs> respect for the truth. Um, I would say, <laughs> you know, it's not it's not the same environment where like things get corrected or you wait and take your time, which on the left, in the mainstream media, we do. And the, the left wing media just isn't. Like on the far left, we don't have a far left media ecosystem the same way we have a far right. Like we have a few progressive magazines and then The Nation and Mother Jones, but they're, that's not an equivalent. Mm -hmm. And it's not as well resourced either. Yeah. Yeah. Some of these things are resourced and like a million. Here's the other thing that has gotten increasingly more obvious over the pandemic. The right wing media ecosystem is free. And Everything the about it is and great. the mainstream high quality and left wing media ecosystem is behind a paywall, mm -hmm. um, and so like l just very very generally, it is much easier to share stuff on the right, and it is much easier. Like I use Apple News now because I was trying. I want to. I can't subscribe to everything, but at least with Apple News, it gives me like a smattering of some things. But I can't even share an Apple News article, right? Because unless you also subscribe to Apple News, you can't open it, right? Um, so so the left like cannot be engaged in being digital soldiers in the same way that the right can for like infrastructure reasons as well. I think we have time for one more question. Do foreign governments use memes as a way to influence the political narratives in the US as much as we do ourselves? So the as much question is impossible to answer and I'll tell you why and that's because platform companies have no obligation to tell the truth to anyone and they manipulate their own data sources even in instances where they are given the data giving the data to outside researchers to look at so there was a big scandal in our field around um facebook was going to give uh hundreds of millions of URLs related to the 2016 election to researchers. There was this huge fund that was set up and that there was going to be all these lock and key mechanisms for people to get access to them. And uh, the links come out and they are not what researchers had expected. And millions of dollars at that point had already been invested in these research teams. And then a year later, Facebook was like, oops, we only sent half. <laughs> So you entire you know entire labs students writing dissertations on this data set, and so we cannot trust the numbers that we get from these companies because they are always going to be burying the bodies. We are at the Shorenstein Center soon going to be releasing uh, a project called the Facebook Archive where we have um, the Haugen leaks that went to Congress last year. It's taken us a long time to anonymize all of these um, images and, and documents, but we're very close. And we believe um, that folks like the UN, as well as folks like 
journalists internationally, once they get their hands on this data set of Facebook reports and research about its own platform, that we're finally going to start to scratch the surface about what's there and how these platforms work. As researchers, we've had to be really um, careful about what we call disinformation. So you have to know the intent if you're going to call something disinformation. So we don't always know where things come from, and that's why we partner with journalists uh, to try to get to the bottom of things. But I would say that for all of the digital shenanigans that go into meddling in elections, you can be sure that parties are doing it, businesses are doing it, foreign operatives are doing it, hackers are doing it just for the love of, uh, anti-establishment, uh, anarcho folks are in on it. But at the end of the day, you have to balance that question about what am I seeing in the information environment against, well, what could they really change? And the thing that I like allow myself to go to sleep at night with <laughs> is that it's really only a battle around 5% of the population. Most people pick a team and they vote for that party for the rest of their lives. Very, very few people switch political parties over the course of their lifetime. And so that gets to the question of, well, does it even matter, right? And one thing though that I think Again, I, I stay up a lot, so, uh, you know, we have to wonder about is not just, well, is it convincing someone to switch a team, but is it convincing people that all hope is lost and voting is not worth your time mm -hmm. or being politically active in your city is not worth your time? Is it convincing you that the whole system is corrupt and your participation doesn't matter? And I think that that's really dangerous, especially for certain groups of people who have only, uh, you know, in the last hundred years or so gotten voting rights. And so I think we need to, as a public, demand higher uh, information integrity. We need to demand what I call talk, timely, accurate local knowledge, right? Doesn't have to take the form of a newspaper, but we need real talk from our communities. and. We need to build a public interest internet that caters to our communities and is accessible. Um, and at the end of the day, we also can't have all of our tech companies own all of the things that would allow them to control our cell phones through our internet, through our ISPs, and then over to the communication and the advertising that we see online. And so we really need a much more robust technical sphere uh, at the end of the day. So I know that that's not the entire question, but <laughs> the, the way that you can drown out the influence of other people is by getting more people to participate in ways that improve talk, timely, accurate local knowledge. And I guess like the final takeaway, I think, in some ways is that these platforms are not being abused by these meme warriors. Like this isn't, we're not talking about hacking. It's not illegal. It's not the dark web. These are folks using the infrastructure of the internet the way it was designed to be used. They're just really, you know, they've learned how to get our attention and how to make things happen and how to incite feelings of rage and violence and that then result in then people saying like, okay, I actually am going to do something like the system doesn't work for me. You've convinced me and now I'm going to show up, which is what happened on, on January 6th, where all people from who are represented in every chapter of our book found their way there um, for various different grievances. But what what helped them to come together and to get the message that was reinforced to them that they needed to be there was people who used the internet exactly as it's designed to be used. Mm -hmm. And that's why like, it's not fair for uh, to put the onus on us as individuals to, to be like, we just need to be smarter about what we see. Cause it's all, it's like systems that were designed to influence us. 
On that note, I think that's all we have time for. Thank um, you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Jo I'm supposed to give an official outro, I think. So let me do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Joan Donovan and Emily Dreyfus, co-authors of Me Moors, The Untold Story of the Online Battles Upending Democracy in America. Just a reminder to all of you that Me Moors is now available for purchase uh, either here in the lobby or at your local bookstore. And if you'd like to support the Commonwealth Club's ongoing efforts in making virtual and in-person programs possible, please visit www.commonwealthclub.org. I'm Lauren Good. Thank you again and have a great evening. Thank <laughs> you.